So I actually just got back in from Guatemala a couple days ago. I was speaking at an international indigenous business conference and we had uh, indigenous people from around the world and let me tell you there's a hunger for business trade um, across the world and there's this uh, energy, this momentum that is occurring with indigenous people and Canada is no different and you're going to hear a little bit about that today. But before I get started I want to thank everybody for being here and uh, Gary for uh, asking me to come and address your audience today and also to recognize that we are on the traditional territory of Treaty 6 and specifically Enoch First Nation. So uh, definitely acknowledge the, uh, the traditional territory. So I realize probably one of my biggest challenges in addressing you today is the fact that you've got a belly full of food. And I actually had this spot uh, when I was in Guatemala the other day as well. So I'm going to impart on you some traditional Anishinaabe uh, practice. Now you wouldn't look at me and consume, assume that I am uh, very traditional, but I like being in suits, but I also love being in my bush clothes. I'm actually a hunter in my community. So everybody stand up for one second. Just take one. I know you've just sat down, but one second. So sitting out in the bush, or I'm, I'm actually a, a big moose hunter, but I've been learning how to deer hunt and uh, elk hunt as well. And sometimes it gets pretty cold in Thunder Bay. I know people in Edmonton, Alberta are tough as well, so you know what the cold is like. But uh, when you're sitting there and you've got to get that blood flowing, you put your arms out like this, don't hit anybody next to you, and give yourselves a, a few of these. There we go. Get that blood flowing again. There. Now you're all uh, traditional Ojibwe hunters. There we go. All right. So I want to start off a little bit about our organization, the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. We were actually founded by Murray Koffler. Murray Koffler was the founder of Shoppers Drug Mart, also a co-founder of... Um, Four Seasons Hotel. Uh, Paul Martin was part of it as well, our former Prime Minister, Ed Brofman, and a few others. And they saw business for Aboriginal people as a lens to empower our communities. Now remember, Canada's first economy was driven by my ancestors, Aboriginal people. We were the ones that drove the fur trade, this first, Canada's first economy. And the other thing you need to realize, and at least reflect upon, is that Aboriginal people have always done trade. We've always been a part of, a, of, of an economy. It just doesn't look like it is today. And it's only been the last 25 or 30 years that we've started to build our business acumen, our business savvy. And I wanted to share some of that uh, today and I'm going to take a look at the past, the current, the present, and the future. Um, so we're a national-based organization. We don't take any government core funding. Uh, we have members uh, from coast to coast to coast competing in every sector both Aboriginal and non. And our mandate is to build business relationships between corporate Canada and Aboriginal businesses and communities. And what's key here is for the mutual benefit. We're all on Turtle Island together. I don't suppose everybody's going to get back on their boats and go back to the motherlands. And our, we're not going anywhere. So we need to find a way to reestablish our relationships. And the natural resource sector is one way and we can do that. As I mentioned, we used to actually have this great uh, relationship based on respect and reciprocity where our ancestors got along great and we coexisted and we all benefited from, from our natural resources. That's coming for full circle. So I want to tell you a little bit about myself because I might push some of your buttons and that's okay. Um, so I am on Anishinaabe from Thunder Bay. Uh, I, my grandfather was a logger, supported 11 kids. My dad was a logger, supported five kids. I went into forestry school, became a, a forester. I um, worked across the country in forestry, really enjoyed it. Uh, but I've also done mining, hydro development, green energy. Uh, I sit on Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers Renewable Clean Energy Advisory Committee, say that 10 times fast. And it's been an incredible learning experience for me for the last year and a half. Um, but if you reflect on some of these photographs, that's a picture of my daughter, and that's off my reserve, um, incredibly beautiful lake. Uh, we actually still drink that water in our lake, and, um, and that's obviously a very important uh, thing to be able to do. But I'm also a hunter. Uh, that's me in, uh, in my moose mitt hide gloves with the beaver trim. And I actually love wearing these gloves whenever I'm in big cities. Uh, wherever I'm in airports, I'll carry them with me. Because um, what it does is it elicits conversations. Because I think generally Canadian public has a general misconception about who we are as Aboriginal people. Are there systemic issues? Absolutely. But I believe, and many of our partners believe, that Aboriginal business sector is the most underreported success story uh, in this country. Um, I also um, live my life like this, uh, the, the surfing picture. After I did my MBA at Queen's, I took uh, my family down there and it was the first time I was learning how to surf. And these, 
if I can use the analogy of the surfboard and the waves. So these waves of opportunities have been coming across Canada for many, many years. And for the most part, Aboriginal people have been watching these waves go by. And unfortunately, that's happened too often. Well, now we're starting to catch some of these waves, and I'll tell you why in a bit. But sometimes, you, uh, sometimes we crash. Sometimes we wipe out and get hurt. But the important thing is that we dust ourselves off and we keep going. So after this picture was taken, just after it was taken, actually, uh, I bit it really hard. And if you've ever seen those beginner surfboards, they're like that thick, they're like that wide, and they're like that tall, and they weigh a ton. I went down, the surfboard went up, and then it came right back down. And it didn't hit me on the left side, and it didn't hit me on the right side. It hit me right in the middle of my butt, and I couldn't sit down for three days. But that's kind of the way it is sometimes. You get hurt, um, and you, just, you, you, you pick yourself up, and you try and catch that next wave. So taking a look at the current status, um, if you look at a lot of our communities across this country, and we're over 630 uh, from coast to coast to coast, plus Métis Nation, plus Inuit, um, we represent a significant portion on that growing and also the fastest growing demographic in this country. A lot of our communities are doing incredible work and are, are, are business savvy. Make it, like, look where we are today, this casino. We have uh, businesses in BC, Chief Clarence Louis, Robert Louis community, Enoch, or sorry, member two out in the East Coast, uh, Swatson. So all these, there's about a third of our communities, that, if I had sort of categorize that they're doing extremely well. And then there's a third of communities, sort of like my First Nation, which is on the cusp of doing some really great work. We've got good governance. We've got business opportunities that are coming along. It's just going to take us a while to get there. And there are a third of our communities who really struggle every day to get food on the table, struggle with school infrastructure, clean drinking water, energy. Um, and so what I'm trying to say is that you can't brush us with one stroke. We are all different. And you're going to hear from Cheryl in a bit. I don't know, she probably, we had a great conversation earlier this morning. And the point of the matter is that to engage our communities, you've got to be very much in the communities. Now, anybody know Canada's national sport? Lacrosse, an indigenous sport, pretty cool. Does anybody know Canada's other national sport? Ping pong. And I'm going to tell you why this is Canada's national sport. So for the longest time, as Aboriginal people in this country, First Nations in particular, we want to do something on the Crown lands. And so we go to the provinces and we say, Big Brother, we want to do something. We want to develop some opportunities. And the province says, well, you're the fiduciary responsibility of the federal government, so we can't help you. So across the table we go. So we go over to the other side of the table and, well, the province said that we want, we want to do something with it, but Big Brother, um, help us out. Well, Crown actually manages natural resources, so off to this. So this national sport's been going on for a very long time. And it's dizzying, and communities are tired of it. And you know what? Industry's actually tired of it, because without direction, clear direction, it's hard to manage those, those relationships. And we're honing in, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a bit, on a significant number of court cases. Now, I'm not somebody that likes to go to the courts personally, and I don't think many people are, but we have had to go there. And industry is actually making the turn. They realize that in order to advance mean, good projects, develop their, and, and, um, well, develop their social corporate uh, license, they've got to work with communities. And what, we're starting, what companies are starting to realize is that, hey, we're not only doing this from an altruistic point of view, we're actually looking at this as an opportunity to add to our bottom line, because we hire and we develop local resources. And our communities are in and around you, mean, you name a natural resource project, and you're going to fall in the traditional territory, one, two, three, or a dozen or more. So this has been happening. So as I mentioned, natural resources is that opportunity to reset our relationships. And I know this group, I, and I'm getting to know this group a little bit more. I know that there's a lot of uh, oil and gas opportunities, and there's uh, relationships that have to be formed, and there are communities. Just be mindful of the traditional territories. And actually, when you start to get down to conversation, and I'm going to show you a value chart that the values aren't that different, so keep that in mind. So um, the number of court cases that have been coming down have been 90% of them been falling in the favor of Aboriginal people in this country, provinces, uh, Supreme Court of Canada. We've got nearly 200. I know, it's quite something. And um, this has brought industry to the table. 
whether kicking and screaming or being proactive, it doesn't matter. The most important thing is that everybody comes to the table and we, and we work things out. And I truly believe Corporate Canada is making that turn and that's what the CCAB does. We build, help build those relationships. Now, the challenge is sometimes just reconciling our difference. And as I've already mentioned, we're very different. Some of us are Plains Indians, some of us like me are Woodland Indians, there's Coastal Indians, there are Inuit, uh, Métis, and sometimes, and, and, and that, that surfboard analogy of saying when I got beat up, sometimes I get beat up by my own people because I'm very pro-development as long as it's done with the sustainable practices as, um, as uh, um, responsible as we can. Uh, so best practices, uh, best technologies, uh, and best relationships. But there's also relationships that have to be healed in this country between Canadians and Aboriginal people. And these things aren't going to happen overnight. We realize that, but it takes with under, it takes a, the starting point is to understand and to engage and not to feel like there's never a starting point because as they say, the best time to plant a tree was 100 years ago. The next best time to plant a tree is today. So start planting those relationships because they're going to pay huge dividends uh, down the road. Now this is a value table that I was talking about. So corporate world and the Aboriginal world. Corporate, you need revenue. That's your responsibility to your shareholders. Well, Aboriginal people are no different. We have responsibility to our communities and our constituents are, are our community members and the seven generations that follow. Um, corporate world needs human resources to fill this, uh, the skills and, um, and the employment opportunities that they require to make their projects go. And although I truly believe immigration is an important part of that um, process, part of the solution, I think where we get ourselves into trouble is when we ignore Canada's fastest growing demographic in this country, which is Aboriginal people. Over 50% of our population is under the age of 25, 26, um, and we're all over the country. So to ignore that natural capital, human capital, we do it at the detriment. And the other thing you need to think about is Yes, there are some challenges, although some of those systemic issues, low education rates, high social uh, impact with alcoholism. I'm not going to pretty anything up. These things do exist. But Canada's Aboriginal people, unfortunately, at this point, we fall largely in the liability column. So how do we invest in that liability column to put the Aboriginal people in the asset column that's going to improve the bottom line? Because when Canada's Aboriginal people are strong, this country becomes that much stronger. But at the end of the day, it's about security for your projects. It's also security about our communities. We've been on this land for thousands of years. We're not going anywhere. Projects will come and go. So we need to make sure that we understand that concept as we develop projects um, going forward. Business support services. Companies need good contractors to do the goods and services that they require to build their projects. Well, there are 37,000 Aboriginal businesses based on some 2006 census data that are competing in every sector across this country from coast to coast to coast. That is an incredible resource to tap into for goods and service contracts. And it also builds up your social license. It also adds to your bottom line because a lot of these companies are local. We're very concerned about our, our environment as everybody here. I know well, there are a lot of ranchers that you know, you've got, you, you know what it is to work the land. Now just multiply that by thousands of years. We know the importance of the land. And so we've got to take care of it. But we also have to balance that with the needs of employment, revenue generation, uh, project development. But in the end of the day, it's about certainty. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I want you to think of a couple numbers in your head. I'm going to give you some context. What do you think Aboriginal people are contributing to Canada's gross domestic product in this country? Think of a number. Now, of that, what do you think is the number for Aboriginal business contribution in this country? Let's give you a second to think about it. If you were anywhere near $32 billion, you were, which I, 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 I'm sorry, I, most people don't come anywhere, think that it's that, that large. Or the $13 billion of that is coming from Aboriginal businesses in this country. That is a significant market that Canada shouldn't be ignoring. So we are actually net contributors to Canada's economy. Unfortunately, what most people see in the papers is the muck, the drain because that's, we need to sensationalize to sell papers, I guess. But what they don't see is the significant contributions of many people. Um, you know, 
the one thing that I didn't talk about and sometimes talk about is as a First Nation person, um, I was the very first person in my family history to go beyond high school and then college, then university, then a master's degree. And, and I'm extremely proud of that. What I'm more proud of is that there are thousands of other Aboriginal people that are more experienced, more educated than I am coming up and making a difference. The challenge has been in Canada is that we extract our best human capital, the talent pool from our communities because we haven't had opportunities to develop our projects. And we end up on the other side of our communities working for government or industry or what have you. The challenge is to bring that talent pool back to support the communities so that we can build a healthier relationship. And I've got ideas in that. I don't have enough time to talk about it today, but we'd be happy to, uh, to engage that in the future date. So what companies can do now? I know um, in this audience, uh, there are some smaller companies, but there are just they're concerned citizens, um, ranchers, but there are also businesses as well. So investing in those relationships, and I think you kind of got that from my speech so far, uh, de-risking your projects. We've got this um, other thing uh, that sometimes irks me when, <laughs> oh yeah, we need to, the communities need to develop capacity. And it's like, well, yes, communities do need to develop capacity, but also within your companies and your organizations, you also have a responsibility to develop capacity. You also have the responsibility to make sure that the people that you work with understand what the Aboriginal context is in this country. So hiring Aboriginal is, is one way to do that. And the other thing that, I, that I'm a big advocate for is, um, and we've got an org, uh, the Canadian Board Diversity Council in Toronto, we have a relationship. It's about hiring Aboriginal people, not only as the front line staff, not only as your managers and your executives, but also at the board level. Now there are thousands of Aboriginal people that are quite qualified to sit on corporate boards. What kind of message would you think that would be sending to Canada and the Aboriginal community if you were to have Aboriginal people on your corporate boards direct, helping direct your, com your companies? So we have a PAR program. It's not golf, although I know there are a lot of great golfers. A lot of First Nations golf too. I'm okay at it, but there are some outstanding First Nation golfers. So PAR stands for Progressive Aboriginal Relations, and it's a, it's a third party certification program which helps facilitate uh, companies' um, strategic position, views, uh, outlook, um, strategies for engaging communities. And so there's a community case that gets built up, and there's also um, a business case that gets built up. So most people in this room know it, you know it, have heard of ISO. We don't necessarily know all the particulars about it, but we know that it's probably a good managed, well-managed company. With PAR, it's a very similar um, tool in that not everybody understands what PAR is, but people know that it's a company that is engaging on a regular basis. No, are they always getting it right? No, but they're always continuing to raise the bar. So they actually evaluate a company's performance in a number of areas. Um, what's fascinating about this now as a Canadian, for the longest time, although attitudes are changing, when we compete in the Olympics, it's just great to get on the podium. But with this PAR program, it's amazing. The companies that engage in this program are all shooting for gold and they're really being competitive. Those four key areas that they're, they're being assessed on is the way that they employ Aboriginal people, the way that they invest in communities, the way that they engage our communities and businesses, and the way that they support business development, otherwise known as procurement. As Chief Clarence Louis would always say, if you want to support Aboriginal people, buy Aboriginal. And those are the three levels. And those are the four performance areas that I've just mentioned. Now, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through uh, best practices. Uh, we actually have a best practices document on the website for companies that are looking to engage, looking to try and figure out uh, what some of the best practices are in employment, business development, community investment, and community engagement. And this, this presentation will be available, I understand, online. But to give you a sense of the type of companies that are going through this program, these are the ones at the committed level. Austin Powders, not that one, a billion dollars, but Austin Powders has actually been around for over 100 years. They're a blasting company creating business relationships with communities. Um, Britco, Be Clean, Carillion Group. Um, we've got um, Brooke McElroy as an uh, architectural firm. So it's, the program is very contextual and it is also very respective of of sizes of companies as well. It's not just the big companies. So we have one company at bronze level standing right now, Fortune Minerals. 
we've got a whole list of companies at Silver, and here's where you start to recognize some of the companies. Um, and then here are some of the companies at, at the gold level. Up. So these are companies that are day in, day out, trying to make a difference and doing some incredible work, um, stuff that you wouldn't even heard of 10 years ago, that are now just a, a, a part of the lexicon of, of Aboriginal, or about business development with Aboriginal communities and businesses. So I wanted to sh see, has anybody read any one of these books? OK. So not many. That's OK. You're going to have some holiday time to get away from the Canadian winter at some point. I would uh, challenge you to pick up one of these books. I'll give you a quick description. So the Arenda actually won Canada Reads, Joseph Boyden. Um, this book, and it's also an understanding that as Aboriginal people, we're very different. And we've, all, we've, we've had conflict with each other for thousands of years. We used to kill and torture each other for a very, very long time. We still do that. We just do it politically. But the point of the matter is that we are very different in, in many ways. But our connection to our land and our, and our, and our youth um, and respect for our elders is one, or just a few items that hold true across the country. Uh, the Inconvenient Indian, actually, Thomas King, this is a second, um, um, oh my goodness. I'm having a brain freeze here. Nonfiction book that he's written. And it really does kind of walk through colonialism. So you'll begin to understand of North America why we're in this situation. Why are there so many uh, adversarial activities? Uh, why our relationships are the way they are? Um, the Inconvenient is a great read to help flesh out. If, 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 if you are pro or uh, anti-Aboriginal, it doesn't matter. You need to read this book to get a better understanding. And then the last one is a great read. It's fiction, you know, Indian Horse by Richard Wagamese. Uh, it's a great Canadian story. It's about, uh, it, trust, it touches on the traditional view. It goes to residential school, one of Canada's darkest marks, I believe. And uh, then it goes and it gets to hockey, and, um, which most people are, I would assume, in this, this, this room are fans of. And it just kind of, it's a great story. You can read that one in, in a day if you wanted to but just to help provide a little bit of con uh, just a little bit of flavor, different flavor. But I want to leave you with one last thought here, and I truly believe this. Now, the opportunity lies in the ability to really align our strengths, and there are many. I also recognize that there are weaknesses that exist, so we need to manage those as well, those blind spots. We need to really be careful for those. But at the end of the day, doing the same thing over and over is just insane, so we need to be open to change, open to new ideas. And as a forester, it would be remiss on me if I didn't put something in forestry in there. So here's a compass. I lived with one of these in my pocket for many years. And if you're off a degree, in his point, and to get to the apex of something, you can be significantly out down the road. So the little differences that you can make today can make huge impact tomorrow and can pay huge dividends or can put you in, the, in, in some, some, some deep, dark valleys. So. Keep that in mind as you go about your daily day, your day-to-day -day operations. I know Aboriginal issues can be very complex, and um, and at sometimes very controversial. But without conversations, without engaging, without trying to understand each other, we're not going to get to where we need to be as a country. And as I've mentioned, when Aboriginal people in this country become stronger, this country becomes tenfold stronger because of it. So with that, thank you so much for having me. And if there's time for questions, I'd be happy to take them. Are we good? I don't know. I'm looking for Brenda to tell me if we have time for questions or not. We'll take a couple anyways. Go ahead, Gay. Uh, could you answer this for me, please? If, uh, if three First Nation youths approached you and uh, had completed, say, completed high school, and they asked you how they could get started uh, in a business, uh, what would you advise them? That's a great question, and I'm glad you brought that up. One of the things that, um, you know, I sometimes get asked by businesses that are just kind of entering into that conversation with the Aboriginal communities, um, and they're like, well, we don't really know the capacity of the community. Are there any, you know, I mean, we just, we just don't know. Well, it's, until you engage, you're not going to know. So when you get into the community and you start building relationships, there are always going to be those gems 
those First Nations, Métis, Inuit people that are going to want to build something, like a Dave Tucker who started off with one truck and grew a multi-million dollar business. There are the Dave and Nicole Boucher's of the world that grew multi-million dollar businesses. How they got started? They got started because the company believed in them enough to actually support them by providing small contracts and getting them started and letting them grow. And as they grew, they built capacity around them and hired more Aboriginal people and got spin-off opportunities. So you see that chain. But more specific to your question, um, when you find those gems, it's incumbent on all of us to actually nourish that relationship. Obviously, businessing, or sorry, we do also a lot of research um, in our organization. And some of the, the biggest barriers to our people are uh, business plans, getting access to financing, and, and like many people in the room, getting access to, to, to talent. Um, so business planning, uh, helping, and the other thing is that Aboriginal people, we don't, especially for on-reserve population, we don't have uh, ways to leverage our nat our, any kind of assets on the reserve because they're owned by the federal government, essentially. Um, so they have to borrow from family members. But if you can find ways to help those, 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 those entrepreneurs get started, small contracts, um, and, and nourish them, mentor them, uh, and hopefully over time they'll be uh, successful Aboriginal businesses that are making contributions to their community as well as contributions to the bottom line of your companies. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. I think we have time for one more just at the front here. Uh, JP, what does uh, consensus mean in the Aboriginal world and, and how do you, if it, if it has a meaning, uh, and how do you work towards it? Easy question. <laughs> what, is, what does consensus mean in the House of Commons? I don't know. <laughs> um, that's a really good question, Ken, and it really does vary. As I mentioned, like Aboriginal people are very, we have, like even in my own community, I'll just reflect personally so I won't get myself into too much trouble. In my First Nation, as we, I was advisor to chief and council and led, up, led the economic development in the community. And under chief and council, you have a responsibility. They've got a mandate. And you go ahead and you work hard at developing projects. In our community, it was a sawmill, a pellet mill, a 10 megawatt hydro project. And um, we're on the peripheral of the ring of fire. And plus, we've got some small forestry uh, um, contracts and the potential for uh, just put a little context, uh, for some tourism because we live on an incredibly beautiful lake. And as you go forward, consensus is about continuing. When you think you've consulted enough with your, even as a First Nation, you've consulted enough with your community, times up by 10. And there are always going to be community members that are going to be opposed to any kind of development, going to be opposed to anything Chief and Council has to say. It's no different than anything that we see in our politics today. But the challenge is, and probably the misperception is, we have the Assembly of First Nations and our previous national chief, Sean Atlio, charged with the most incredible task. If I asked everybody, how many people in this room, a couple hundred or so, if I asked everybody in here to come to the consensus on painting this room a certain color, good luck. To have on the Education Act, for instance, which uh, was one of the catalysts to, to Sean's uh, resigning, um, 633 First Nations trying to decide on one issue, consensus, good luck. We're very different. Um, what the federal government has is they have an orange party, blue party, green party, red party, and they debate and they make things happen. We don't necessarily have that. So consensus, depending on what scale that you look at it, will make a big difference. Consensus as a regional body of Treaty 6 or Treaty 8 or the ENOC or councils or so it just depends how you look at it. But at the end of the day, it's about consultation. It's about engagement. We're never going to reach 100% consensus on anything. We're just people. People have different values. We're brought up differently. Um, and at the end of the day, it's about what's best for a community what's, and, and, and continual engagement. And it's a two-way flow of information. I hope that answers your question, Ken. Okay. Good. Uh, thank you, JP. It was a very informative uh, discussion. And I uh, have a small gift here to oh, you. Thank great. you. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. All right.